This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here, and we have got a lot of new information to talk about this week with Starship Development. Things have changed and new facts have come to light based on a number of conversations and tweets from Elon Musk. We are going to dive right into that along with checking out the progress at Boca Chica. An incredible and successful flight of Starship SN6 on the second 150 meter hop test for the Starship prototypes. We had another two beautiful Falcon 9 launches with SOCOM 1B, then the second Starlink launch with the most beautiful satellite stack deployment footage that we've seen to date, and Rocket Lab are back in action with another flight just days ago. So we've had a lot of new information come to light this week about the future of Starship development. As tweeted by Neopork here from Renders shown in last week's video, the previous thought was that the booster would have six legs. After replies to these renders by Elon Musk himself shortly after these were presented to the world, we learned that the booster design has actually shifted to four legs with a wider stance. This will reduce the inefficiencies that would be caused by these legs getting in the way of that plume when in a vacuum. Of course, at sea level, the plume doesn't expand out enough for that to be too much of a problem. But just like with Falcon 9, as soon as the vehicle passes up above 15 kilometers or so in altitude, you can really see how quickly that plume expands out, which is known as under expansion. I followed up with this thread asking if there was currently a super heavy thrust structure being built. The design work that needs to go into the creation of a thrust structure that can accommodate the colossal thrust of 30 or more engines would be huge. Then Elon Musk replied here saying that yes, indeed, a thrust structure for the booster was being created and that this is the hardest part of the booster design. So yes, thanks very much for the reply on that. Of course, since then it sounds like this may be reduced even further down to 28 engines total, which we'll talk about more shortly. Tim Dodd also grabbing Elon's attention asking how many Raptors would be needed for a booster hop and got a great answer from Elon on exactly this, saying that SpaceX will only need two engines for this. There continues to be great progress with Raptors with it reaching 230 metric tons of force at its peak pressure with some damage. That version would likely be able to have a comfortable running limit of around 210 metric tons of force. That being said, the aim is to have an engine that can achieve over 250 metric tons of force by sometime early next year. This story keeps on getting better. So yes, apart from the lack of a nose cone, aero surfaces and header tanks, a super heavy prototype should be constructed in a very similar way to what we've seen with Starship prototypes. One of the main differences will be with the design of the thrust structure, which needs to be capable of supporting much higher thrust and a significantly higher weight load. Now, Elon Musk talked in an interview for the Humans to Mars Summit during the week, and we got a few more interesting pieces of information from this chat. He again confirmed the construction of the first super heavy booster prototype is underway, but more interestingly said that they were looking at fewer than 31 Raptor engines for the booster in order to simplify it, saying that it might be just 20 eight engines. Now the current thought is that they will crank up the thrust on the engines in order to do this and that there would be now around 20 engines in the outer row with somewhere between 250 to 300 metric tons of force as the goal. Also mentioned was that the propellant for this was intended to be 78% liquid oxygen and 22% liquid methane from this point on. When asked when he predicted the first orbital Starship flight and return, the answer from Elon Musk was that this will probably be next year, adding that the first ones might not work and that no one has made a fully reusable rocket before. A vehicle that has twice the power of the Saturn V and also has a better total delta V efficiency. If this all works out as planned, that is the gateway to the solar system right there, which really does change everything. Now, a few questions were asked around life support systems for longer trips to Mars in the future, which Elon shrugged off saying that these haven't been worked out in any depth and that the first priority is really making the thing work. Interestingly, the current plan is to initially fly hundreds of missions before flights with humans would occur. This will allow any issues to be worked out well before lives are at risk. A great idea of course because Starlink missions can be used to test this out along with cargo missions to Mars. So yes, I'm super pleased to hear him talk about all this and of course the next Starship update event in October is going to be incredible. We can't 
wait for all that. If you're interested in last year's event, I've got a video on that here. Also, a huge thank you to all of you as well for liking these videos and subscribing. A few weeks ago, I had a silly stretch goal of trying to hit 200,000 subscribers by my birthday in October. Honestly, in my mind, I thought at the time that there was very little chance of that happening, but wow, you amazing people have given so much support. It looks like that could actually happen now being past 190,000. You all just blow my mind, thank you. It's such a huge privilege to create this content for you. Now, the week of Starship development sure has been another interesting one. After two days of delays, SN6 attempted to hop twice during the testing window on Sunday the 30th of August. After a few hours of preparation with the road initially closed early, the first signs of venting could finally be seen from the tank farm. The tanks started to be filled and pressurised to flight levels. However, at 1.15pm, both the liquid oxygen and liquid methane vent valves opened quickly, depressurising the vehicle. At that point, we knew we had just had an abort. The workers returned to the pad for a short amount of time to make some adjustments, and the pad was cleared once again. Venting from the tank farm picked up once again at around 2.30pm, pointing to the fact that the team was going to attempt that 150 metre test flight once again. The side engine chill vent seen here opened at 2.57pm, which is usually a good sign that the hop will occur around 20 minutes later. The 10 minute siren then sounded at 3.08pm, and the team was once again ready for the SN6 flight to take place. However, at the time the wind started gusting up to 30 miles per hour and the test was aborted at T minus 5 minutes which was likely due to this. On the Monday, Cameron County published new road closures for SN6's hop with the primary date of September 3rd and backups on the 4th and 5th. And then the big news for the week. We once again saw history being made by SpaceX with the successful 150 metre flight of SN6 occurring on Thursday afternoon. The 10 minute siren sounded at 12.38 and the team was ready for SN6 to take flight, this time with calmer winds. Amidst a massive plume of dust at 12.48, Starship SN6 roared to life and rose gracefully into the air in a smooth motion over the landing pad. Just like with SN5, SpaceX was not live streaming the event so he didn't have the elevated perspective and were instead engrossed in the footage by the incredible people out there capturing from different viewpoints. A few nervous seconds again passed for all of us as we were waiting to see if the Starship prototype survived the landing and as the dust cleared, there it was, SN6. SN6 standing upright with just a little lean. The workers and onlookers can be heard cheering with the astounding success being celebrated together around the community. Although there was a small fire that started at the base of the skirt, SpaceX were pretty quick to extinguish it and all was well. Later on, of course, SpaceX released beautiful footage of this from their drone, along with onboard cameras on the side of SN6 and within the skirt section watching the legs and the Raptor engine closely. It didn't include the footage showing the legs flip out from within the skirt this time, but you can see them flip out from the drone shot. It's just amazing that we get to witness all of this and we're expecting to see another hop or two before SN8 takes to the skies on a much higher flight test. Nice work as always there SpaceX. So with all that going on, what has been going on at the construction site? Well, early in the week, a pair of aero covers were delivered, believed to be destined for Starship serial number 8. These covers are speculated to be placed above the forward fins, not only to decrease drag in this area, but also to protect the hinges and mounting points of the fins. Also early in the week, Starship SN7.1, which is of course a much smaller test tank, was fully assembled as well. As seen in Brendan's diagrams here, the test tank consists of a forward dome and after dome with the thrust puck as well as a skirt. The tank will be rolled down to the pad in the coming days and then placed on the new testing mount fitted with the thrust simulator. Moreover, according to the new road closures published by Cameron County, SN7.1 could be tested on the 6th of September. During this test, the tank will be filled with liquid nitrogen and then pressurized to a hopefully record breaking pressure. This will not only verify the new 304L stainless steel, but also the new thrust puck design discussed in previous videos. On Thursday, SN9's aft dome was sleeved and Mary spotted this section here which is a second five ring stack with stringers. This stack will most likely be a section between the tanks and the nose cone for serial number 9. Wherever we see these stringers that shows a part of the Starship that needs this extra reinforcement. In this case the strings are placed on this stack so that it's going to be able to support the weight of the nose cone, forward flaps and the header tank with liquid nitrogen among other components. Along with all that the work on the main core levels of the super heavy 
Empire Bay are constructed now and we'll likely be seeing the roof being added to the top of this huge structure very soon. Lastly at the build site SN10's downcomer and thrust puck were delivered. Along with this a sleeve for a forward dome was also spotted by Mary, presumably also for SN10. So yes we're already up to the double digits now. Brendan has once again made a diagram to display where these pieces will go. As always, a massive thank you to the amazing Mary, aka Boca Chica Gal, capturing all of this incredible material every week there with NASA Spaceflight, RGV Aerial Photography grabbing all that amazing stuff there from above, Lab Padre of course with the 24-7 live streams, beautiful work from all of you guys, and of course go and check out the full footage and imagery from the links in the description and support where you can there. There is a lot more to see direct from those channels. Now we had another incredible Falcon 9 flight this week. It was launch number 15 for 2020 with SpaceX sending three satellites into orbit earlier in the week. This flight sent up Argentina Space Agency's SOCOM 1B satellite along with smaller rideshare satellites TIVAC 0172 and Planet IQ's GNOMES 1. This was the second and final SOCOM satellite in that constellation and was also the first polar launch for SpaceX from Florida. Interestingly it was also the first time since the late 1960s that a rocket used this polar launch corridor. Two years ago SOCOM 1A was launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base on the west coast and successfully deployed into a sun synchronous polar orbit. The main reason for the move from Vandenberg on this occasion is believed to be due to low launch demands from the west coast. This has essentially enabled SpaceX to reduce staffing there until scheduled launches gather momentum again towards the end of the year. These satellites use synthetic aperture radar and this technology can help to predict, model and plan emergency management in response to a variety of natural disasters. They are also capable of operating alongside the Italian Cosmo SkyMed satellite constellation and what that means is that customers can benefit from consistent coverage twice a day. So the launch of SOCOM 1B from the east coast at Cape Canaveral used the Southern Polar Launch Corridor which was re-established in 2017 with strict criteria to be met including that the launch vehicles have got the capability for autonomous flight termination. This launch path is a first since the late 1960s and the infamous Cuban cow incident which saw a Thor rocket stage fall into Cuban territory taking out an unfortunate bovine. Now as always it was interesting to see the graphics here showing the orbital path running south compared to the more common launches that typically head in an easterly direction. This sped up vision here really showcases the unique path that the launch took into orbit. Then of course we had the booster returning back to landing zone 1 approximately 9 minutes later and it was flawless. Here we see some great footage of it breaking through the cloud layer giving a real sense of speed as the booster makes its way back to the pad. This was of course the fourth flight for this booster core having already completed the previous missions for CRS-19, CRS-20 and as well the Starlink mission from June 13th this year. Also just check out this video here from Red's Rhetoric. The different perspective here is always interesting to see so be sure to check out that channel and show your support there as well. Awesome footage. The new fairing halves were recovered in a solo effort this time by Miss Chief as Miss Tree was already stationed for what turned out to be a cancelled Starlink launch which was rescheduled for later in the week. It was originally to be on the same day so we didn't get to see that record double launch opportunity that we talked about last week. Julia as always out there grabbing some beautiful shots caught some images of the fairings being returned. Both halves having been fished of course out of the ocean successfully. Nice work there Julia. So yes SOCOM 1B was successfully deployed completing that constellation of this batch of satellites. Rideshare satellites TIVAC 0172 and Planet IQ's GNOMES 1 successfully deployed about one hour into the mission but these were camera shy and we didn't get to see them depart sadly. A huge congratulations to SpaceX on this one. This mission depending on how people are counting was the 100th launch and a truly amazing achievement and we can't wait to see many more to come. Now along with all of this we also had another Starlink mission which was the 12th batch sent up. Once again lifting off from Kennedy Space Center the Falcon 9 sent a full batch of 60 satellites without any rideshare mission included this time. This batch of satellites just like the last two have got those new visors on them so that should be helping reduce the reflectivity in orbit and cutting down on some of that light pollution. We haven't heard a lot about how successful that has been at this stage but it's going to be interesting finding out more about that as news develops. The 
booster itself has flown only once before on the GPS-3 mission at the end of June, so quite a quick turnaround there at a little over nine weeks. The booster landed successfully on the drone ship named Of Course I Still Love You, and the deployment of the Starlink satellites was I think the most spectacular thing. Just check this out, we can see the full release of the tension rods which we've only seen a few times before, and then we have this amazing footage of the Starlink satellites drifting slowly away there to begin orbit raising to get themselves into their operational orbit. What an incredible week it's been for SpaceX. Now it was great to see Rocket Lab back in the saddle this week with their 14th launch dubbed I Can't Believe It's Not Optical, a beautiful mission which I'm sure was a relief considering the issues that occurred with the previous lost payload. We'll talk more about that in a moment, but real quick, this video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN who have been wonderful supporters of my channel here for many months. Now a virtual private network or VPN is a great tool to allow you to open up the internet to a whole new world of entertainment. If you are missing shows, movies or documentaries on your streaming service, Services while other countries have that same content available, look no further. With Surfshark VPN you can very simply change which country you're accessing the internet from and well, nothing, that's it. Reload the page or app and you now appear to be browsing from that location and have access to a whole new world of material. It isn't just great for unblocking content such as social platforms and news services that have perhaps been blocked from you. It's a way to protect your privacy. The internet should be a log-free open hub of knowledge and by using Surfshark VPN, you can take control of your online security and visibility. You can protect yourself from the many data mining services, internet service providers, or perhaps even from those around you who may have very very differing personal views or beliefs. If you're considering a new VPN or changing your current one, and at the same time would like to support my channel here, go to surfshark.deals slash Marcus and you will get 85% off and three extra months for free. That deal has been around for a while now, but I believe it's being changed over the course of the next few days. So pick that up while you can. There's a 30 day money back guarantee, of course. So feel free to give it a try, hassle free. To check it out, the link is right there in the description below. So yes, this mission for Rocket Lab marked their return to operational flight since the recent unfortunate electrical anomaly that saw the unlucky Launch 13 not reach orbit which resulted in the loss of the payload. It's just awesome to see Rocket Lab back in action for that 14th launch named I Can't Believe It's Not Optical. That mission name was chosen by the team at Capella Space to acknowledge the synthetic aperture radar imaging technology on their satellite named Sequoia, and a homage I guess to a certain television commercial from the dark recesses of time that we had long forgotten. Darling, look what I've brought back. I can't believe it's not bother. It's the well, forgotten until now. Thanks a lot for that, guys. The first satellite for Capella was launched at the end of 2018 via a rideshare mission with SpaceX. Now, due to customer demand for more data and requests with short lead times, Capella set out to redesign the next batch of satellites known as the Whitney class of satellites. Now, just an interesting side note here, it was meant to launch on an Indian Space Agency rocket, but due to a delay, Capella Space had to switch to SpaceX and hitch a ride within the SOCOM 1B in March. But then, of course, that was delayed due to the travel restrictions caused by the pandemic. So off to the rocket launch supermarket once more and Rocket Lab were chosen. Of course then there was delays as we saw earlier due to the launch anomaly, so after all of this shuffling around and all this time spent, poor Capella Space ended up launching from another country only a few hours after the SOCOM 1B mission anyway. Isn't hindsight just a wonderful thing? Now Capella Space have got a plan to have a constellation of up to 36 radar satellites capable of sub half meter resolution. This will provide clients with hourly information updates for any location on the planet, day or night, and regardless of the weather. Capella, of course, are by no means unique with their offering there. ISI, which is a company from Finland, already offer radar imaging services, but Capella is really the first commercial US company to offer such a comprehensive data set, which would be of high value to many clients, including from a national security and intelligence perspective. At the request of Capella Space, Rocket Lab could not broadcast the satellite deployment, but we enjoyed the events leading up to this nonetheless. It was fantastic to see the announcement of the successful mission and Peter Beck in the background here appeared to breathe a very heavy sigh of relief. Well done guys on such a rapid return to launch activity, we've missed you all in the news feeds. 
Now, just quickly, a huge thank you to my amazing patrons. I simply couldn't do what I'm doing here without you. Your generous support has allowed me to increase the time I can spend on this content, and I just can't thank everyone enough for that. Further help just allows me to do even more. If you like what I do here and you'd like to join our awesome patrons, head to patreon.com slash Marcus House. You can interact with me more directly via the included roles in Discord. You can check out some exclusive patron on the content. You can also have your name listed right here like all of these other incredible people. Thank you all so very much for your support. Of course, not everyone can donate in this way, but regardless, you guys just simply watching, liking, or commenting in videos matters. Your subscriptions matter, and by watching and supporting this channel and discussing these topics with family and friends, you are helping to educate those around you. You're amazing, and you're helping to drive this global passion to make all of these dreams of colonizing other worlds a reality. A huge thank you as well to my Quality Control Squad here for helping me research and proof the material for these videos. If you're interested in these topics and would like to be a part of this, follow me on Twitter, and please do get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have my video last week talking about United Launch Alliance's aborted Delta IV launch, along with Starship and James Webb Space Telescope updates. In the top right is my latest video, and in the bottom right, content that YouTube has selected from a channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching, and we'll see you all in the next video.